Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in today's vlog you will see my interview with Mason about his classic Exceder. But before we start with the interview, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and very important, also make sure to click the bell button because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. All right, here it is, the story behind Exceder, my interview with Mason. Enjoy. The man behind the project Mason is Dutch DJ and producer Jason Gronis. Since his childhood, he has been playing and listening to music already. When he was just six years old, he began to learn playing violin. That resulted in him using his violin skills during his DJ sets between 1999 and 2005. In 2004, he even joined Chesto during his world tour. Not only he was the warm-up DJ during this tour, he did also perform Little Industry on stage during several of the big Tiesto shows. In the year 2006, Mason's track Exceder came out, which was one of his very first ever releases. It became a big success in the clubs and festivals, and Exceder got supported by lots of house, techno and electro DJs. In 2007 the track got re-released, but this time with vocals from American rapper Princess Superstar. And that version became a big hit in the club scene, but it was also a chart success in several countries around the world. For this week's vlog I sat down with Mason in his studio in Amsterdam to ask him about the story behind Exeter, his new album and more. My first question to him was if it is true that he comes from a family with a very musical background. Yeah, well, at least a very artistic background. Um, my father is an is a artist, a painter, a sculptor, and my mother is an actress, as well as my sister. But also from my mother's side, there are a lot of um, uh, violin players and classical musicians in the family. So yeah, it's been a bit of a uh, creative uh, upbringing. Um, my, bunch are, my parents are quite happy, and they kind of let me do whatever I felt like doing, as long as I kind of committed to it. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was music from a very young age. Yeah. So do you remember how old you were when you started like uh, listening to music? Yeah, forever really. Uh, yeah, I've been always listening to music, obviously first kids music and all that. So uh, what were some of the bands or the acts that you just listened to, uh, to back then? I was really into musicals and Beatles and um, when I was a kid, I was a kid singer in a TV show. It was uh, something that was only in Holland, but back in those days we only had like uh, one TV station. So it was a kind of a big thing, like a sort of Disney club. And I was one of the singers. When I was six, I couldn't even read the lyrics. I, I, I have pictures where I'm holding the lyrics upside down. <laughs> and I was, um, uh, yeah, so I was singing songs on TV and uh, from six years old. And um, because of that, I was also hanging hanging out a lot in recording studios because we had to record all these all these albums. Uh, so I, uh, always in breakdowns when everybody was free and was going out for to play soccer, I wanted to hang out near the sound engineer and look at all the big tape reels and the big SSL mixing consoles. Uh, and I'm really at that age, I already felt like, yeah, I want to be a sound engineer when I grow up. So you were six and you wanted to be a sound engineer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I kind of didn't fully become a sound engineer. I didn't know there was such a thing as creating music. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's somehow, I mean, I still hang out a lot in recording studios. Yeah. So speaking of uh, creating music, how old were you when you, start, when you started like making your own music? Well, yeah, so six I started singing and also around that time six, seven I started to play violin. Um, but when I was 15, I started to DJ. So that was the mid nineties, uh, I'm 40 now. Um, first, uh, initially it was just DJing, first hip hop and then some other house stuff as well. But I think from 97, 98, so about uh, when I was 18, I started to do my first steps with producing and uh, yeah, it was before audio on computer, so it was still with a sampler and sequencer and mm -hmm. yeah, it was pretty uh, more complicated actually than it is now. Yeah, yeah. So you did also study uh, music uh, composition and performance at the Utrecht School of Art. Um, so yeah, you were already DJing back then, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I started DJing in the, in the 90s, 95. I had my first residency in 96 and I, I was 16 and it was in one of these bars where there uh, were where, where only like drug dealers and prostitutes and stuff. And I was like this young kid playing records in between. Mm -hmm. 
And then from 98 onwards, I started to have my first shows abroad as well and started touring. Yeah. So was it difficult to, to combine school with DJing? No, I mean, it was... Um, yeah, when I was in high school, I already knew, like, uh, you know, I was only, only hanging out with other guys that were also into DJing. We had really had our focus on making it and practicing and rehearsing. I have, like, sh- shitloads of boxes full of mixings, uh, like, mix tapes and stuff like that. And then when I started to go to college uh, and I uh, started to, I did a course for, uh, for, for composition, and then it all became intertwined and I, you know, it was all one big, yeah, development. Yeah, yeah. I believe you were in the same class as another uh, Dutch producer who was very successful uh, at that time, if I'm correct. Mm-hmm. Quite a few actually, but I think you're referring to uh, uh, Bartes, yep. Bart Klaas from yep, On yep. The Move. Yep. Yeah, we were the only two guys that were doing dance music uh, in our year. The other guys were into rock or classical or hip hop. It was all one big, uh, it didn't matter which, which sort of genre you were in. Um, so we were, uh, Bartes and me were always um, sort of, you know, checking each other's demos and giving feedback and all that. Yeah. So there were also other people in the class that, that became like uh, well known later? For sure. Uh, for instance, uh, Tore, for the lead singer from the Staat, oh. uh, was in there. Um, Kipski, uh, Shamsedin from Nobody Beats Drum. Yeah, too many, really, a lot yeah. of guys. Yeah. So uh, after a four year study, you did uh, graduate cum laude, which is uh, very impressive, of course. Um, how important has this study been for your later career? I don't know, it was, uh, when I came in there, the only thing I knew was um, uh, making house records and they straight away, first lesson, they said, okay, now you have to make within 24 hours an ABBA song. So for me, it was pretty much thrown into the deep end uh, to get a, um, yeah, to, to, to get experience in other genres and to uh, widen my horizon a bit. But so it helped, it definitely helped a bit, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, yeah, most things I just learned by just doing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about your track Exeter, which was uh, one of your very first releases. And was there anything that did inspire you when you started to work on Exeter? Um, yeah, I think uh, 2004 I, I stopped all my, I, I was working in different studios as sort of daytime job and I stopped all my uh, daytime jobs and to fully commit to my own music and back then I also became a resident of a party called Electronation um, it was a party in Holland but also a few parties abroad and it was like we, we organized events weekly like in Rotterdam Amsterdam Utrecht all around the country you know in London and Antwerp and we were this clan of guys uh, doing uh, electro electro housey parties when sort of that was a new sound and um, it was a really a sort of uh, really special, magical few years for me, and Exceder really um, was made with that sort of audience and that those parties uh, in my background. You know, that was kind of the the soil and what it was burn, uh, built on. Yeah. So can you tell a bit more about uh, the production process of Exceder? Yeah, I was in, in between moving studios, so um, I temporarily had no, temporarily had no studio, so I had to put all my stuff in my kitchen till I like moved to a new studio like a month later or something. Uh, so it was it was literally like a Mac and a MIDI keyboard or something uh, in my kitchen table with like the pots and pans and the cooking stuff on the side. And um, yeah, so I, I, it wasn't even be, like made in a real studio, <laughs> it was made in my kitchen. Mm-hmm. So you didn't lose like a, you used like a lot of equipment? No, not at all, no, ah. no. So how long did it take you to, uh, to finish the track? Oh, I have no idea anymore, it's a long time ago, but it, it probably, yeah, maybe all together uh, in hours, maybe 20 hours yeah. or so. Oh wow, that's that's pretty quick. Yeah, so we've we, throughout a week or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what was the hardest part of the production? I have a feeling back then I knew so, I did, didn't know so much about production. I had no idea how a lot of this stuff worked and I was just kind of doing it pretty intuitive. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember like I opened the files back later on and I remember that well, there's no f- really basic things like sidechain compression which you hear like in every dance track around the world. I didn't even do that, you know, it was it was just sounds that I felt like worked well together, a little EQ here and there. Um, yeah, yeah, I know there was a lot of um, tremolo in there which I really liked and I remember like when I was making it I was feeling like yeah this is kind of this kind of rocks, I had all these little chop up things where yeah, like uh, and then uh, and those kind of things that uh, really may gave it its own character. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember feeling like ah, this 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 works well, but I also felt it was a bit 
easy and uh, I wasn't really sure if it was too cliche to release. So uh, I ended up releasing it as a B-side. Um, the A-side was a more sort of weirder Italo records and then I thought on B-side we can put this more easy record um, yeah, for people to just play out. So was, it, was it difficult to, to find a label for, uh, for Exceder? No, not at all. Um, we initially released it just in Holland on this super small label we were running with Electronation and Don Diablo. Um, it was called Mid of the Road Records and it was just our own kind of imprint. But it was small and really Holland focused and once we released it things just kicked off and straight away like bigger labels wanted to sign for the world and have marketing plans for the rest of the uh, all the other countries and, and, and it became kind of a bidding war mm -hmm. kind of pretty straight off the back of it. So. We then decided to work with Great Stuff in Germany. Uh, so they did initially the instrumental worldwide and made it like a beatport number one and you know it became a big Ibiza anthem. And then uh, like a half year later, uh, Ministry of Sound did uh, uh, the mashup, the yeah, vocal mashup. The vocal version. Yeah. So uh, the original version, the instrumental version, uh, do you remember some of the DJs uh, which were playing the track? Yeah, pff, yeah so many. It was uh, like from Pitong to, to techno guys to house guys to. Electro guys, it was one of those records that was a bit in between genres, you know. Uh, so it was it was not really electro, it was not really house, it was not really tech. It was somewhere in between. So I really remember that summer of 2006 that you kind of sometimes on festivals heard it from multiple tents. You know, you heard it, you heard it somewhere. The techno guys yeah. playing at some some point. I heard it double at the same time. So I heard it like. So I guess that was the cool thing about it. There was a bit in between things, and that made it accessible to a lot yeah. of people. Must have been pretty unreal for you, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was working already full time in dance music. I was playing a lot and touring a lot. So I, I wasn't like a new kid on the block or anything. But it was um, my records, like my own productions, were kind of new. It was my third record, so I was, I was still sort of insecure about it. You know, just starting out on that side of things. You know, I was just DJing mostly, and um, so it was a really uh, surreal to all of a sudden get into that sort of major league. Yeah, yeah I, I can imagine. So yeah, you already mentioned it, the, the, the version with the Princess Superstar, which was uh, signed to Ministry of Sound, uh, Perfect Exceder. Uh, can you tell how the idea was born for this version? Yeah, so uh, around the, the end of the summer of 2006, kind of everything that could happen with a club track, instrumental club track, kind of happened. You know, it was like the essential tune, it was the, the main Ibiza anthem, it was on Beatport number one for two months or something. So we felt like, okay, the, everything is asking for it to make it into a radio record, you know, because everybody loves it in clubs and uh, and I love pop music. I've no, you know, uh, dislike to pop music or I'm not too underground to feel uh, uncomfortable with it or anything. But I just want it to be done right. So I worked on a lot of different vocals, uh, vocal versions um, with different singers. I, I can show you 20 different versions of, of vocals on, Ex on Exceder. And everything was okay, but nothing was quite right. And there were also a lot of mashups going around on the internet, as as it usually happens with bigger records. Uh, so people mash it up with other vocals, and sometimes it's like uh, really bad. And this one with um, Princess Superstar, because Perfect was a single of hers before that, uh, worked well and did, sounded well. And we felt like it also became popular on the internet. So we felt like ah, this might work. So we uh, contacted Princess Superstar, who was up for doing it for real. So. Uh, we re-recorded her vocals and really f uh, worked together with, with Ministry of Sound in England to uh, create a full, full on pop, pop record. Yeah, and that went uh, pretty successful because it became a top three hit in the UK charts and also in uh, Scotland, Finland, Spain, Belgium, Ireland, Hungary and the Netherlands. It was like a top 20 hit. So were yeah. you surprised by the success or did you already have a feeling like, yeah, this vocal version will be big? Yeah, well, it was kind of, uh, the expectations were high, you know, if, if a club record does so well, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of um, demand for it. So everybody felt like, okay, it's it's going to do well to a certain point, but we didn't know how to what point. And then when it got out, it was just like bang. And yeah, uh, yeah. life became pretty busy straight away. I believe the track was even used for TV commercials for the movie Bruno as well, right? Yeah, as well. And a lot of uh, games and uh, yeah, movies, commercials. Yeah, it's still, it's still used for a lot of things. Yeah. It just well, became one of these classics. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so it's, yeah, I'm super grateful, you know. Um, you need, it's not the record that I'll put, up, put on at home uh, anymore, but it, it kind of gave me an audience and gave me the opportunity pr to present all my other music to. And from that moment on, I could tour internationally and that, that didn't stop. Yeah. So do you have any idea how many copies of Exceder and Perfect Exceder have been sold? No clue. 
No clue. Okay, so in 2009 you founded your own label, uh, Animal Language. Why did you decide to start your own label? Because I, I'm quite a diverse producer, I suppose, and um, because of Exceder, the record labels were kind of hope, like always, uh, hoping that I would make something very commercial like that for them to for them to sell music. But I also wanted to be able to release my more weirder and more stranger stuff that I also really dig, stuff that I want to play in my own DJ sets, and. If you have such a commercial hit, kind of, uh, uh, that's not like the thing that big labels are looking for at that moment because they think, ah, we can, this, this guy can also, you know, make a next big hit. So, um, so I wanted to have like a platform which became Animal Language where I could just do whatever I felt like, yeah. whenever I felt like. Mm -hmm. So when there was a gap in my release schedule, still, I can just sort of say, okay, fuck it, I'll just release this next month and I, this feels good and mm -hmm. gives me a lot of freedom. And that kind of evolve, evolved into a bigger label, you know, we're now 100 releases further and I also, you know, sign stuff from talent and uh, always look for new music. So if you guys have new music, it's good, send it to me, info at animal-language.com. It's really hard to find good music, I think. Um, yeah, and we organize parties under the Animal Language flag. We have our infamous cafe rave, I'm not sure you're familiar with it, but it's a thing here in Amsterdam. Um, we, uh, you know, these kind of really dodgy bars where there are like there are only like two alcoholics sitting and there's nobody. We go to four of those bars on one night uh, and bring 300 ravers and a DJ booth on wheels. So we go into one of those bars where there's nobody, bring 300 people, stage dive, uh, trash the whole place, and then go to the next place and the next place and the next place. I've been doing that for 10 years now. So we had like 100 bars in Amsterdam or something, and it's all under the animal language flag. So animal language is a bit more now than only label. Yeah. And uh, who's responsible for the great artwork of the label? Some guys uh, also from Amsterdam, they're called Free 10K. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the artwork, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah those guys are super creative, yeah. So, uh, so far you did release two artist albums uh, on your own label, but your brand new album uh, Frisky Biscuits, which came out in uh, September 2020, came out via Mark Knight's Tool Room Records. Uh, what's the reason you did, didn't release it on your own label? Yeah, because it, it really organically um, uh, happens. Uh, I, I released in 2019 something on, on Tool Room and uh, I met them in London and I played them some new stuff and we were already planning to do two singles this year and then I played them also the other stuff I was working on because I always create a lot and uh, we then started talking like why don't we put it into an album and uh, make the singles part of that album. So it was for me the perfect um, yeah, perfect thing to work on during the whole lockdown and when Corona came, uh, because I just locked myself in the studio for a half a year and finished the album. Yeah. And it was, it's, I have to say, it was a real pleasure to work with the Tool Room team. They're very um, proactive and creative, and yeah, it's been a really nice uh, collaboration. So, uh, Frisky Biscuits, how did you Frisky. come up with the title? Frisky Biscuits, yeah, it's a bit of a word of play from uh, Disco Biscuits, and it's. Um, yeah, I think my, my, my records are kind of different and a bit left of center and quirky and maybe a bit frisky. Um, yeah, it just felt felt good. Yeah, yeah. So how is the feedback on the album so far? Yeah, it goes really well. We have about a million plays now almost. Um, and yeah, uh, the re reception has been really good. And it's been, uh, you know, it's been really nice to work on uh, with such a big label and their whole infrastructure, you know, they know how to place an album like that and um, yeah the, the feedback has been really good I still get daily like messages from all around the world from people who dig it and uh, yeah that's that really makes it worth it you know yeah yeah so we're recording this interview uh, like in the middle of a pandemic so I guess normally you would travel around the world to play gigs and promote the album yeah so, so how do you feel about all of this yeah it sucks you know but you know it will also pass um, Obviously, it would be great to release it when I could, off the back of it, make tours and you know, uh, maybe together with Tool Room or uh, or their artists. And but it just you know, well, there was also some artists decide not to release during Corona. You know, they think like let's I'll release it next year or a year after when Corona is done, and then I can tour off the back of it. But I, I have like the, the opposite of a writer's writer's block. I kind of always write music so I'm, I'm sure next year I'll have new stuff and other stuff so yeah. I thought like fuck it you know I'm just gonna make this and release yeah. this now and uh, yeah we'll see next year where we are so uh, what, what are you working on right now yeah so the album is just been released um, so finally I have after like nine months or so I have some breathing space to 
to work on new things. Um, I started working on something with Dorley. I started working on something with Ten Snake and on f- with a few different vocalists. And I uh, was yesterday recording uh, with somebody from America. And yeah, so I'm just uh, demoing a lot. Yeah. And y- the way I work, I just create a lot. And then from the 100 records, I release one, you know. So I'm now like every week re- making shitloads of demos. and. We'll see where where it ends up and what label and what what the single's going to be. But I've, for me now, it's just nice to just create, and I think it's also good for for creators and musicians to keep on creating. So you you know it's like a muscle, and you keep on training it, mm-hmm. and you get better at it every uh, you know the more you more you make. You know, I think the the core of every good record is a good theme and a good hook. And with all these equipment and and soft plugins and all that, you can make any kind of ideas sound great and fat but for me it's the key to wait till you have to write it here so I much rather like create 50 and then throw away 49 and, and work on finishing one of them so yeah uh, demoing a lot okay good so yeah during the years you did work with a lot of big names uh, to name a few uh, Curtis Blow Rosen Murphy uh, Alex Clare Jocelyn Brown Ronnie MC and Sam Sparrow that's a pretty impressive list yeah yeah yeah, it's been a real honor. Uh, I mean, uh, these people are really, very talented, obviously, and uh, it's really inspiring to work with these people. It also makes me want to work harder, you know, because they, you know, they have such a talent, and I want to uh, live up to those expectations. I guess because my music is a bit more, um, yeah, it has, it's a bit more poppy, funky. It's there's overlap with pop music, so my uh, collaboration with pop artists also work easier, I suppose. And maybe also because I have a um, uh, background in, in playing instruments and stuff like that, I can also um, speak a bit more the same language with uh, those guys. And yeah. So uh, is it difficult to get in touch with some of the big names uh, that I mentioned before? Yeah, I mean, there have been guys that I just would want to work with, but they were just impossible to reach. But some, some, you know, we just try and. Um, and sometimes it's just at the end of the day, it's about good music, you know, for instance, Rasheen Murphy, she uh, she just okay, just send me stuff, and if I dig it, you know, we'll take it from there. And then she digged it, so then we started working. So it's also a bit encouraging to think, okay, as long as if the music is good, you, you can work with quite big people. And I think it's also just a matter of just uh, not giving a fuck and just contacting yeah. people, you know, say, hey, this is who I am, this is what I do, you know, you need to be confident on that. That's true, that's true. Are there still people you would really love to work with? Sure, L- lots of them. Um, yeah. yeah, Snoop Dogg, if you're watching, <laughs> work for me. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're watching, but you might. Uh, Mark Ronson, if you're watching. Uh, who more? Um, Bootsy Collins, if you're watching. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bruno Mars, if you're watching. Well, you'll find me. So is there still something on your bucket list, music-wise? Good question. Um, I like to produce more also for other artists, pop artists. Uh, I like to write songs, and so because Mason, uh, there you know, th- still is quite wide uh, sound-wise, but there's there are still borders. Like, and uh, I create a lot, and some stuff that I make just doesn't really fit Mason. So um, would like to also, yeah, uh, produce stuff for for a bigger pop artist. Yeah, yeah. And the last question: pineapple on pizza, yes or no? I'm. <laughs> um, I'm not ordering it that much, but I'm not as uh, fanatic against it as most people. I have in the past, I gotta say. So yeah, let's go for pineapple. Good. Well, thank you very much for your time and good luck with everything. Thanks, man. All right, that was it. This week's vlog, my interview with Mason about his classic x Mason, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and very important, make sure to subscribe. Also make sure to click the bell button, because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, bye bye.